Great. Well, thank you for coming and welcome to the opening session of the Capitalism Next seminar. Um, Capitalism Next is a year-long seminar which is exploring whether and how capitalism can evolve towards genuine sustainability. Uh, my name is Mike Lee. I am a second year MBA student here at the Haas, uh, Haas School of Business and also uh, along with Mira Inbar, the co-president of the Net Impact Club, which is putting on this seminar. Um, before I begin, I wanted to get a sense of who's in the room. So with a show of hands, if, if you are in the business school, uh, if you can raise your hand. Okay. Um, how about the law school? Any uh, law school students? All right. Um, public policy? Public policy. Um, ERG? Erg students, great. Um, who else am I missing? How about any undergrads? Great. Natural resources, engineering? Natural resources? Public health? Alums, okay. Anyone else that we've missed? Anthropology. Anyone else? Private sector, okay, nice. The private citizenry. Great. Well, um, it's exciting to have, uh, you know, one of our intentions was really to create a multidisciplinary conversation. And so we're really excited that we have a broad kind of representation of the Berkeley community and beyond here. Um, like I said, this event is being organized by the Net Impact Club, which, for those of you who don't know, is a community of students uh, that is interested in how business can be a critical part of the solution to the, the world's problems from climate change to global poverty, education to health. And we're putting this on in, with generous support from the Sustainable Products and Solutions Program, which, uh, for those of you who don't know, was established exactly one year ago with a generous grant from the Dow Chemical Company Foundation. And the goal of the, the SPS program is to create a multidisciplinary learning and research environment where the foundations of su sustainability, society, science, engineering, environment, and finance are all considered simultaneously as new products and solutions are explored. Clearly, there's a great fit with the, with the topic of this seminar. So in business school, we hear a lot about specific examples of sustainable business. Um, we hear examples like Cliff Bar, Patagonia, Whole Foods, and others. And there's indeed great progress in, in businesses becoming more conscious and proactive about reducing their envir environmental footprint and being proactive about solving some of, some of the world's problems. But in general, these examples are the exception rather than the rule. Um, much like a cactus growing in the desert, these businesses have survived and flourished in a relatively inhospitable environment. These success stories are remarkable and deserve to be celebrated, studied, and copied. But relatively little systematic attention is paid to the desert and whether it can be changed. The goal of this year-long seminar is to look at the broader capitalist system and explore how we can transform it into a thriving ecosystem for sustainable business and more broadly sustainable living. This is the first of six sessions throughout the year and uh, this first session attempts to lay the groundwork for future sessions by exploring questions like what is our current capitalist system and why is it unsustainable? What are the principles of a truly sustainable capitalism and how might we get there? Our next sessions uh, that, that will take place throughout the, the fall and the spring will focus on specific kind of perspectives uh, in, in, along these questions, whether that's emerging markets. We have a panel coming up on November 10th with uh, looking at how companies, big companies, are partnering with social sector organizations to uh, provide economic, sustainable economic development in developing countries. And then we're also going to be looking at design, corporate governance, and policy, and also spirituality over the course of the year. So, uh, you know, Stay tuned and, and look out for, for those sessions coming up. Now to our guests. Ultimately, we're about th this, what we're trying to do is make this economic system work for us. And this has also been the life's work of our distinguished guest and our moderator. Now I found a quote of Hunter Lovins on the, uh, on the internet. And uh, in it she said, capitalism is the worst economic system, except for all the rest. It has many flaws that its critics are quick to point out, um, and it's part of what's driving us in the direction of unsustainability. But I believe, she says, capitalism, conducted according to its real logic, 
is an important part of the solution to the very serious challenges facing us today. Trained as a sociologist and lawyer, Hunter co-founded the California Conservation Project and the Rocky Mountain Institute, which she led for 20 years. Uh, she's uh, the author, co-author of uh, the bestseller, Natural Capitalism, and she's consulted for scores of industries and governments worldwide. She has uh, companies including the Royal Dutch Shell, Cliff Bar, Walmart, Interface, and governmental clients including the Pentagon, the US EPA, Department of Energy, and uh, governments around the world including Jamaica, Australia, and the US. What's interesting, she, I found that she also served serves as an advisor to the energy minister of the fledgling government of Afghanistan, where she helped sell the, the minister of energy on a vision to promote economic development through uh, developing sustainable, uh, kind of sustainable business and energy. Throughout her career, Hunter combined, has combined a brave idealism with unyielding pragmatism for what works, a devotion to big ideas with attention to the details of implementation. She is known for her environmental advocacy but she is also a passionate advocate for the preservation of a quality of human life rooted in our social norms, cultures, and communities. In the end, I think she is the perfect person to kick off this year's year-long seminar, and we're glad to have her. Uh, briefly before uh, giving, uh, handing over the mic to Hunter, I wanted to also introduce our interviewer slash moderator for, for, tonight, for today, and that's George Scharfenberger, who is the executive director of Berkeley's Blum Center for Developing Economies. And for 30 years, George has worked at the intersection of social, of social sector and private sector, exploring the best ways to promote community empowerment and sustainable development around the world. Uh, from working on, from promoting community-controlled sustainable resource, resource use in Gambia, to helping set up a system of natural parks that enable small businesses to build sustainable business uh, in Madagascar, George has a keen insight and experience into how institutions and systems need to work together to promote true sustainable development. Um, I want to welcome uh, both Hunter and George and hand it over to Hunter. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm good to go. Just set it up on top. I just need this on account of there are a couple facts and figures that uh, were in the cron this morning that uh, I'm not going to remember until I say them two or three times. Gravity. <laughs> Stay. How many of you are scared? <laughs> How many of you are excited? More excited than scared. That's good. Aren't these amazing times? I mean, if you're an anthropologist or an economist or, I don't know, engineers, buildings are sort of buildings, I guess, still, uh, unless we have an earthquake. But we are in the midst of, you know, capitalism, we're in the midst of a capitalist earthquake. These are, and these are these figures I wanted to uh, get for you. Oh, come here. There we go. This morning's cron. Um, America's first trillion dollar deficit is at hand. Fiscal deficit 2008, 438 billion. Now headed for a trillion. This crash, we're, huh. there's an old uh, cowboy uh, cartoon of, uh, Old boy sitting there on his horse and another one underneath a horse. And the one underneath the horse says, uh, Homer, I don't know if I'm all right yet or not. This here wreck ain't over with. <laughs> this here wreck ain't over with. 40% of stock value has vanished. Almost $9 trillion. $5 trillion in real estate value evaporated. And we're not, we're not done yet. So. For anybody who is a student of capitalism or interested in these issues, this is the most fascinating time to be alive. We are, and I've, I've said to my students for years, we're inventing new institutions as we try to get a handle on how do we implement sustainability. Things like Chicago Climate Exchange. We're trading carbon in this country right now. Something like 20% uh, of the stationary carbon is under contract to be traded with 17% of the Dow Jones industrials. Well, at least they were last week. In a country where there's no law that says you have to, simply because a brilliant man named Richard Sandor said, wait a minute, governments don't make markets, traders do, I'm a trader, let's make a market. And in 2003, he opened Chicago Climate Exchange, 
with 16 companies and the city of Chicago and World Resources Institute and natural capitalism. And we're now all trading carbon. So when, when people say, you know, markets don't work, yeah, they do. And market mechanisms work even better. What's now at risk, I think, is this uh, little ideology of capitalism. And you will see in the next six months a lot of people jumping up and saying it's the death of capitalism. And in fact, uh, the Financial Times said that last week. It's the death of capitalism. I don't think so. Capitalism, I think, lies in the heart of anyone who is entrepreneurial and who cares about the productive use and enhancement of capital. What's capital? Money, yep, yeah, that's a form of capital. What else? Goods, services, manufactured things, what else? People, human capital, what else? Knowledge, social capital. How about the biosphere? Natural capital, upon which, as the ecological economists point out, the entire economy rests. You can't have an economy unless you have a healthy biosphere. And because you, you do away with your healthy biosphere, you do away with life and thus economics. Sorry, economists, but uh, you are a subset, a uh, subdiscipline of thermodynamics. <laughs> Indeed, we have thought of the economy, and this is, this is one of the fundamental questions I think we're going to get to wrestle with now. What's the economy for? It's the economy, stupid. We're going to hear that tonight. It's the economy. What is the purpose of an economy? Do we exist to serve it? Or did it get created to serve us? And I think that fundamental discussion of what do we want economic activity for is one that we should revisit as we rethink what is this thing, capitalism. How many of you have existed, lived within a socialist or communist regime? A couple of you. Would you choose to go back and live there? <laughs> Some, maybe. I wouldn't, frankly. I spent uh, some time in, uh, in Russia when, before the, the fall of communism. And the, uh, the so-called rise to prominence of the only ideology left in the world, capitalism. Well, now this only ideology left in the world is kind of laying at our feet. Which is to say, I think, we get to create the next ideology. I think this is a time for really big ideas. And for asking these questions, what's the economy for? Marx did. You go back and read early Karl Marx. You know, Marx, oh, horrible communist. Go back and read Karl Marx. He was asking, what is it that makes human beings happy? And believe that work, what you do with your hands, what you create, is an expression of yourself. And that when you separate this creation of things, whether it be a loaf of bread, or a, the building of a tool or the sewing, when you separate yourself from this process of owning it and, and creating it, you introduce a profound alienation. And thus, the, he believed the means of production should be with the workers. Now, along come Engels and Lenin and a few other folk, and it becomes uh, the sort of evil empire that uh, we had a Cold War with. But if you go back and read these early theorists, there, there's some interesting stuff there. Adam Smith, the father of the invisible hand, free market economics. You know what his uh, degree was in? What chair he held at the University of Glasgow? Was he an economist? He was a moral philosopher. And again, he was asking these really deep questions about how is it that you achieve human happiness. And all that markets were ever intended to do is allocate scarce resources efficiently in the short term. Markets were never intended to take care of grandchildren. That's our job. That's the job of a free people coming together in a democracy 
and saying, what kind of a future do we want to leave to our grandchildren? Dave Brower, who uh, lived just up the hill, my, my boss at uh, Friends of the Earth, used to say, what do we want the Earth to be like 50 years from now? Let's do a little dreaming. Aim high, he said. Navigators have aimed at the stars for centuries. They haven't hit one yet, but because they aimed high, they found their way. And I think there is no more fascinating time to be having this conversation about uh, the future of capitalism than uh, when all the great ideologies are lying in pieces at our feet and we get to put them back together again. So it's worth, I think, revisiting the history of how we got here. Remember the first industrial revolution? <laughs> Wasn't there, right answer. The history of it as it's handed down to us is that there were relatively few skilled people to run these new machines that were coming in. And so profit-maximizing capitalists economized on their scarce resource. People used their abundant resource, nature, and we dramatically increased labor productivity. If you read The Economists today, the holy grail of prosperity is enhancing labor productivity. At a time in our history when we're not short of people, what we're short of is intact nature, natural capital. Remember, there are at least four forms of capital, financial, manufactured, human, and natural. And then, as you said, knowledge. There's also legal capital. There's cultural capital, social capital. Mike Fairbanks counted seven forms, and he wasn't even counting natural capital as we do. So if there are all these forms of capital, good capitalism ought to be seeking to enhance all forms of capital as the basis for the creation of productive wealth. That's capitalism. What we have had, what's laying at our feet, is not capitalism. It is, you might say, crony capitalism, or in Dave Corton's words, industrial capitalism. It is a perversion of what Adam Smith was talking about. And if you read Adam Smith, his body of work, not just a few selected paragraphs from his economic thinking, you will see that he actually had a pretty profound commitment to what we are now calling sustainability. And indeed, there's a young man at Cambridge writing his dissertation on Adam Smith as the first sustainable theorist. Pretty interesting stuff. And I think it's worth asking, who are the real capitalists now? I think it's not the people on Wall Street who have used all sorts of legal machinations to accumulate great amounts of personal wealth while at the same time impoverishing a lot of other forms of capital. We're liquidating every form of natural capital on the planet in the pursuit of financial capital and to some extent manufactured capital. And we're now to the point with climate change where in, if we do not get a handle on climate change in the next couple of years, says the scientist Jim Hansen. It will go beyond human capacity to deal with this problem to the point that we will have runaway climate change and within 100 years or so, 60 to 90 percent of species on Earth will be gone. That's really bad capitalism. Destroying the capacity of the planet to sustain life is just plain bad business. And so we have this interesting phenomenon where a growing number of business leaders, like the CEO of Tesco, the Walmart's competitor in the UK, is starting to say things like, I'm not a scientist, but I listen when the scientists say that if we fail to deal with climate change, the consequences will be stark and severe. We are going to have to rethink everything about how we do business. He says it won't be easy. I don't kid you that it will be. But what we need is a revolution in how we live and work. And so he has committed Tesco to cut its energy use in half by about 2010, to label all products with their carbon footprint. Surprise, their competitor in this country is now pledging even more. Walmart, the evil empire, yeah? 
Walmart has pledged to be 100% renewable energy, carbon neutral, zero carbon emissions, zero waste, and to sell only sustainable products. And I spoke to the whole senior management at Walmart. I wanted to look Lee Scott in the eye and see if I thought he was for real. And I stood about this distance from him, and I held up a book, How Walmart is Destroying America and the Rest of the World. And I said, this may come as a surprise to you, but you have critics. <laughs> I said, if you want to deal with this, and fair enough, you are putting solar panels on your roof and you're selling organic underwear. But if you roam the planet rapaciously, exploiting people in developing countries and in communities here at home so that people like me can throw away more junk, this is not sustainable. What would a truly sustainable Walmart business model be? He said, I don't have all the answers. But I took the book and I chucked it at him. I said, if you want to deal with critics like that, I think this is the question you now have to answer. And watch this fall. It's supposed to be this month. We'll see whether or not with the economic <laughs> hiccups it comes out. Walmart is poised to make a tectonic announcement. If they come out with it, it literally will change the face of business. And it will involve a little group out of the United Kingdom called the Carbon Disclosure Project. Any of you ever heard of them? I see some nods. It's a group of young people. One or two folk at the top that have been around the block a time or two. By and large, it's just a little group of people who came together with this wild ass idea. Why don't we send out to the Financial Times 500, 500 biggest companies on Earth, a little survey saying, what's your carbon footprint? So they did. First year, nobody answered. Second year, not many answered. Third year. And then all of a sudden, 66% of the biggest companies on Earth answered their survey. Last year, it was 77%. Why? Well, for one thing, they now represent institutional investors with $57 trillion in assets. Well, at least until last week. <laughs> for another, under Sarbanes-Oxley, the new US corporate ethics law, as if as a manager you fail to disclose to shareholders information that can materially affect the value of stock, you can be personally criminally liable. What's your carbon footprint? They are now sending this survey out to the Financial Times, 1,800. And if this announcement comes down from Walmart, they will be collecting this information from all of Walmart's 60 to 90,000 suppliers. I think carbon is going to be the new currency. Those of you who, several of you came up, said you're now involved in helping to trade carbon. Very smart. I think carbon is going to become another form of capital. We produce a lot of it. Doesn't seem to be uh, in short supply. But the decrements of carbon are going to be increasingly valuable. Now, is there a business model here? That's the question you always get. And now, given this economic crash, what happens to the companies that have taken a, a leadership position in it? Be interesting to watch, won't it? But I, frankly, I think that the companies that are serious about it and that stay the course will be the billionaires of tomorrow because a corporate commitment to behaving sustainably is simply good business. It enhances every aspect of shareholder value. You know, I've said there's a real problem with climate change and the science. Let's assume you don't believe the scientists. Frankly, don't go to Vegas on those odds. But if all you care about is being a profit-maximizing capitalist, you'd do exactly the same thing you'd do if you were scared to death of climate, because we know how to solve the problem at a profit. So DuPont, 10 years ago, announced they were going to cut their carbon emissions 65% below their 1990 levels by 2010. People said, has DuPont joined Greenpeace? I mean, the US says we can't possibly afford to cut it 7% below our 1990 levels. It'd bankrupt the country. Surprise, DuPont's already done it. For a savings 2000 to 2005 of $3 billion, they're now saving $2.2 billion a year on their energy efficiency, eco-efficiency, waste reduction measures. You know what their profit is last year? $2.2 billion. 
A company's profitable because of its energy efficiency carbon reduction program. And in a tough time, when you need to cut costs, let's start cutting waste. The, the canonical um, crony capitalist answer is fire people. No, keep your people. That's the lifeblood of your company. Fire your waste. And in almost every instance, you can cut, you can profitably cut half to three quarters of your energy use, a lot of your materials use. You can dematerialize and produce a superior product. You can use approaches like biomimicry, doing business the way nature does. Nature makes a wide array of products and services without waste, using sunlight, manufacturing at room temperature, with closed loops, the output of any process is food for another. And this approach of biomimicry is now being used by a growing number of companies to drive their innovation. And then you manage every organization to be restorative of the forms of capital that are in short supply, human and natural capital. All forms of capital, but particularly focusing on your scarce resource. This is just good capitalism. And go back to the first industrial revolution. Economize on your scarce resource. So what communities like this one have done in passing the legislation to enable citizens to come to the city and get money to put energy efficiency in and renewable energy, per megawatt saved in a community, you will generate over $2 million in increased economic output. You want economic development? This is the route. Same thing in a developing country. If you want to, you know, the work I'm doing in Afghanistan, if we're going to rebuild the infrastructure, let's do it right the first time. Let's use world best practice in sustainable ways to meet basic human needs, to supply energy, water, housing, health care, sanitation, transportation. So what, what's the US doing now? You're in my tax dollars. Are going into the pockets of Beltway bandits who are telling the Afghan government to build coal plants all across the north and major power lines to bring down surplus Tajik hydropower. We're using last century's technologies. This is not development. This is uh, just another form of colonialism. And is it any surprise that now you hear in the papers, well, we may be losing Afghanistan. Yeah, we're losing Afghanistan because the Afghans see the same kind of crony capitalism that we've practiced here which is now bankrupting this country. So whether it be in a little country on the other side of the planet or right here at home, we have every technology we need to meet our needs. And we have, as at no time in the years that I've been doing this work, the reason to rethink how we do capitalism. Myself, I'm excited. I think we are going to see the kinds of changes that many of us who, who do this work have kind of said to ourselves in the back of our heads, I'll never see that in my lifetime. We are going to see massive change in the next couple of years. The question for us is what kind of change will it be? Democracy is a contact sport. Are you on the team? Maybe that's enough to kick us off. Well, Hunter, I want to start out by saying what an honor it is to be sitting up here with you, uh, and an honor given to me by my colleagues at uh, the Haas Business School. Um, I'd like to start off maybe a slightly different tack and, and go back a bit. The, the audience is a largely young people, uh, kind of setting out on the path of life. Uh, it's always interesting to know people's paths. How did, how did you find your way to this? My, my guess is you didn't, at the age of two, the first word was probably not natural capitalism, <laughs> but, but probably something else. So how, how did you find your way to, to where you are today? I'm not sure how interesting that is, but since you asked, 
My folks had a lot to do with it. Uh, my father helped mentor Cesar Chavez and Martin King. My mother organized in the coal fields with John L. Lewis, so I'm not sure I had a whole lot of choice. <laughs> <laughs> I also was born a rebel. Um, I'm told when I was about that high that um, I would dart everywhere. And so they put a little harness on me so that I wouldn't run in the street, at which point I sat down and wouldn't move until they took it off. I don't, I, I don't remember that at all, but uh, I think I come by my honoriness naturally. My passion has always been solutions. I really don't care about an ideology. And in fact, um, I made a dear friend of mine across the bay, Elliot Hoffman, who runs New Voice of Business, very angry with me last spring because I agreed to advise John McCain. And he, he actually was quite angry with me for about a week until uh, his wife said, who would you rather have advising him if he becomes president? Elliot simmered down. <laughs> but I'll advise anybody if they ask. And I also officially advise Obama. Uh, that said, neither, cam neither campaign has asked for any advice, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> those two titles and two bucks fifty might get you some coffee. But if somebody comes and says, how do we solve this problem? I really don't care if they are a, the CEO of Walmart, the head of state of a government, an ordinary citizen, or, uh, or you know, anything in between. So, good, how do we figure this one out? And that has led me, I've never held a job in, that's not true. I was a waitress for about half a summer when I was in college. I was lousy at it. And, I always tip waitresses really well, because I know what a tough job it is. But other than that, I've never taken a job in the normal sense. I always create the organization that I then go on and work for. I've always taken whatever money I get and poured it into that organization. And that's not at all what drives me. Uh, I've been offered a lot of jobs with a lot of money and said, uh, you want me to move to Washington? No, I live in Colorado and turned down government jobs and big corporate jobs. And uh, of late, the heads of two or three universities, uh, because that would mean that I'd have to do what somebody else tells me to do. And I'm not, I've never been any good at that. So I guess that's why I'm sitting here. <laughs> All right. Well answered. Uh, any particular mentors along the way? Oh, people lots. who kind of helped you? And, and, and how did that interaction uh, play out? Wonderful woman when I was in third grade named Ina Curry. I was uh, very angry at public schools and, in fact, uh, slugged the principal. <laughs> Just, I guess, not advised. And uh, it, it was fairly apparent I was going to get in trouble. So my mother created a school, a little school down in uh, Pasadena called Sequoia, which is still going, I found out, not too long ago. And I was grumbling. My mother brought Ina Curry in to help with the curriculum for the school. And I was grumbling with her about schools. And she said, well, my dear, you can grow up and change them. And that notion of you can change it had an enduring impact on me. Dana Meadows, author of Limits to Growth, Beyond the Limits, wonderful, wonderful woman. If any of you have not read the executive summary of the book Beyond the Limits, it's on my website, www.natcapsolutions.org. That's required reading, the executive summary of Beyond the Limits particularly in what we're dealing with now. Because one of the things Dana said was, it's not going to be a single catastrophe. It's going to be the combination of ecological problems and wars and social problems and economic problems. And it will simply exceed our management capacity to cope with all of it. It's not that it'll be any one. And if you look around us now, that, that really is what we're seeing. We're seeing it because we are beyond the limits of all of our systems to cope with what we're demanding of them. The natural system to supply us the, the natural capital, the human system, the limits of social stability, and of course the economic system we've just found out is a, 
a little weak as well. Dave Brower, of course. And I continue to find mentors, friends. Every time I think that I'm bored, somebody pops into my life that, uh, that teaches me something useful. And so I've quit thinking of mentors as famous people or somebody that I'm going to sit and be a student of and started thinking, OK, who am I going to meet today that's going to teach me something really cool? And then they're, as soon as you adopt that attitude, they're everywhere. My students, right now, the, my, the greatest inspiration in my life are my students. I teach over at Presidio School of Management, a little MBA program we created a few years back because we wanted to weave sustainability throughout every class. So we teach a, I teach principles of sustainable management. But we also teach accounting and finance and products and services and marketing and all of this traditional MBA curriculum all from the standpoint of how do you manage organizations, government organizations, civil society organizations, businesses large and small from the, the standpoint of sustainability. And for example, when I quit talking at Walmart, the head of Sam's Club came up and said, how do I hire your students? And so one of my students spent the summer teaching the CEO of Sam's Club what sustainability is. That's pretty cool for a, for a student uh, who's just had their, uh, their second semester in school. Let me, let me drill down a little bit on that. Um, a lot of students here, as you know, are business school students. Uh, they're taking you know, uh, courses in accounting and management. What, what, what are your teacher, students learning on that side of the bay that's really fundamentally different than what you imagine the students here are learning? Is economics a linear flow? It is, and I see some, some heads nodding and some heads shaking. It is if you read Milton Friedman economics. It's not if you read Herman Daly economics. And so what we do is have the students read both. And as I would expect that you would at Haas. Um, but I run into a lot of B-School students who have never heard of ecological economics. Now I think Stanford, you guys, uh, Herb, Keenan Flagler, Cornell, the, the, the student uh, schools that have a good net impact group will have these kinds of concepts being brought into the classroom. But we have, for example, we, we teach economics from the <coughs> standpoint of ecological economics as a critique of Milton Friedman-esque economics, not the other way around. And in accounting, um, how many of you do GRI accounting? Our students all know what GRI, uh, Global Reporting Initiative. This is, a, again, we, you talk about creating new institutions. World Resources Institute, CERES, uh, there were a couple others uh, of little NGOs, got together with some uh, FASB accountants and said, if you were to do accounting from the standpoint of how do you count the environmental and social values and costs, how would you do it? And it took them, I don't know, six, eight years to build this protocol called the Global Reporting Initiative. And a, a growing number of major multinational companies are now doing their accounts using the GRI protocol. I think within maybe five years, 10 years, GRI accounting will be as common as gap accounting. It will simply be how you do accounting. But not if the people that we train as accountants have never heard of GRI. CSR reporting. How many of you from the private sector are doing CSR reporting? <laughs> Dow is. The leading companies are. This is corporate social responsibility. And again, if you come out of a business school not knowing what CSR is, I'm, I'm sure everybody who comes out of Haas does. This, uh, you guys and Kelly, and I mean, you have a center of corporate responsibility. There are a lot of business schools in the country at which CSR is never mentioned. Is CSR sustainability? You're right. Shaking your head, no. No, it's not. It's, it's, a, it's a step on the way. But is it all the way there? No, of course not. Hi, Gil. Gil Friend, who just walked in, is one of the 
Can we have Gil come sit up here? Absolutely. Gil, come play. Gil, please. Come play. <laughs> Gil, uh, Gil Friend runs Natural Logic here in town. He's one of the heroes of this whole movement. And uh, I'm going to take, oh, we got another mic somewhere. Mike, where'd the mic go? Mike got the mic. Mike got the Mike's mic. Mike's the mic. Here, join us. Chuck, 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 Chuck. <laughs> Oh, well, so much for that. <laughs> <laughs> See, I didn't follow orders at all well. <laughs> as long as you don't slug me like your teacher. Principal. Pr um, principal, sorry, yes. We're talking about what we teach at Presidio. Gil just lectured at the executive program. Um, what, uh, what is it that you would teach at a business school, at a, like at a Presidio or a Haas, that, you would, that normal business students don't get? How to count. <laughs> and what counts? Well, here's the thing, you know, we've, we, for a long time we've thought that part of the problem around business and sustainability is that uh, modern capitalism is focused exclusively on the bottom line, exclusively on maximizing short-term return to shareholders and not considering all these other things that matter, which actually are illegal to consider in half the states of the country under corporate, under corporate law. Um, so that's one problem, but the other problem is that even when we count what we count, we don't count well. Uh, we don't draw the boundaries right, we don't include the right things, we don't include the appropriate time frames in net present value calculations, we don't include the appropriate risk factors of understanding what the risks no. are, what the risks are and how to convert those <laughs> to financial calculations. We're all good old friends here. Um, so We're going to sing pretty soon. Yeah. So, you know, <clears throat> part of the job is to, is to say, let's think about all these other things, but even within the, the official normative conversation of capitalist economics, let's count correctly. Let's make sure we're not leaving value off the table. I mean, right now, everybody's asking us the last couple of weeks, well, what's happening to sustainability in the face of the meltdown? You've probably talked about this for the last couple of hours, a right? A tiny bit. Um, and, you know, the assumption being that sustainability investments are going to have to go by the wayside. Why? Well, because everybody knows that environmental stuff costs you money, right? Well, but it doesn't. It's not a cost, it's an investment. It's an investment with potentially very handsome rates of return. We just did an assessment of a large food processing plant where in one day of work combing through the facility, we found 14% potential energy reduction at a 32% return on investment. Now, you tell me where you can get a 32% on return of investment even six months ago, not to mention right now that's legal and absolutely certain, and why in the world would you not put your money into that if you were being a profit-maximizing corporate executive? Why would you not? So all the more reason right now to trim costs, slash ways, to eliminate inappropriate expenses that, by the way, have negative environmental consequences, lean out your company, uh, figure out where the mark, how to position yourself to be agile in the face of, of the certainty of uncertainty in the coming years. And that's what I would say. How many of you saw the announcement, I think it was three weeks ago, about Johnson Diversity? 160% return on investment in their carbon reduction schemes. 160%. We worked uh, Dow, Dow, Louisiana, a man named Ken Nelson, some time back, had an odd idea. He, had, he put a contest out to workers on the shop floor. How can you save energy? Figured they knew what's going on on the shop floor. He thought he'd get a few good ideas. Twelve years later, 900 workers suggested savings measures. Over 200% return on investment. And over time, the measures and the savings went up because the workers got better at seeing the opportunities. He had, he had figured initially that it was going to be a one-year program and they were going to find the low-hanging fruit, and then, fig then do something else. And it was so successful the first year, they thought, well, let's try it for one more year. And then 12 years later, it's still cranking. How many of you, the B-School students, are taught that you need to have a, a, there's an 18-month hurdle rate? Yeah, a couple hands. That's the standard corporate hurdle rate. If you, can't, if you don't get a payback within 18 months, no way. You know what a two-year return on investment is? 70, 70% 70 ROI. And B-Schools aren't taught this, typically. Again, I'm sure you guys are. Well, you ought to have at least a 10-year payback horizon compared to any other investment you can make in the society now. 
and, and perhaps even longer if you care about having grandchildren. Or, or don't think about payback in terms of years. Think about in terms of return on investment, which is how you think about most of your financial options. Uh, and on that basis, you know, two year, three year, four year is still massively ahead of what you're going to find yes. for any other place you put your money. If I could, could uh, push the conversation a little bit towards a, a topic near and dear to my heart, and that is the uh, developing countries, the poor of the world. Um, in natural capitalism, you talk about the, uh, the kind of the false dichotomy of, of, of growth and justice, the, the false uh, need to, it's not a question of balance, it's a question of integration. Could you talk a little bit about um, kind of the stakes or the opportunities for uh, the others, not only perhaps in, in, in Africa, Asia, but also in our own society of, of this kind of approach. Uh, I mean, to be honest, I think, uh, you know, uh, going out in, in, in different kinds of organizing movements, uh, the environmental movement has not been very good at selling itself to those at the bottom of the ladder and, and who norm often see it as, as something more of a danger, uh, if not at least something more of the elite than something that's in their interest. Our movements have tended to behave like a bucket of crabs. As soon as any one of them starts to gain any elevation, all the rest claw it down again. And there's been this belief that it's a zero-sum game. You either take care of people, or you take care of the environment, or you have a healthy economy. You can't have them all. In the book Natural Capitalism, chapter 14, describe the experience in Curitiba, Brazil, where the mayor, who had been appointed by the dictatorship because they believed he had no, he, as an architect, he would have no political aspirations. Um, he's, he then went on to become the governor of Paraná State and is frequently spoken of as a presidential candidate, said, we're not going to make trade-offs. All of our priorities matter. And we are going to have a design philosophy. How can you love all the children? That's going to be the basis on which we make determinations if this program goes ahead or not. So it was not on even re return on investment, let alone years of payback. It was how do we love the children? And so they built what is now one of the most livable cities in the world, one of the most beautiful. They're very poor. Per capita budget, 1 15th that of Detroit, one of our poorer. And yet they make investments in social justice and in social welfare and in environmental protection as the basis of economic prosperity. And I think this is now really going to be the debate in the next couple of months as we turn over administrations and as the economy either totally collapses or we, we find some sort of a bottom at least for a little while, is what are the, how are we going to make priorities? And you hear people saying, we cannot do it all. In Curitiba, they said any single issue solution is a bad one. If we don't do it all, we haven't thought hard enough about the nature of the solution. In Afghanistan, in the conflict countries around the world, if we do not invest in enabling people there to solve their own problems, in giving them the capacity to make their own decisions, to decide on which technology makes sense for them. We will have more 9-11s. We will have an extremely insecure world. I was recently with a woman who uh, is a Colin Powell protege, and she's now part of the team in the federal government that worries about attacks on the country, teaches at the National War College. And she said, that one of her colleagues recently did a very stupid thing by saying that they, the intelligence community had gotten word that there was going to be a significant attack in the month of October. And she said, you know, she, they, they should have kept it quiet. And I said, why? Anybody who thinks about it recognizes how vulnerable all of our infrastructure is. Where do you get your water, your energy, your food, the things that you have to have? We wrote a book in 1981 called Brittle Power, which we, we wound up putting for formal government classification review. So we did not want to write a cookbook on how to take down the energy system. So what we found scared us very badly. A handful of people can shut off three quarters of the oil and gas leaving Louisiana and do it in an evening. Doesn't even take a hurricane. 
You can take down any electric grid if you know what you're doing. Our water systems are incredibly vulnerable. Our telecom systems are vulnerable. Our systems depend on each other. And we want to have people in the world who hate us. And yet that, that seems to be the way in which we do international development. So what, what connects what Hunter just said about Curitiba and what she just said about brittle power is innovation. You know, and aside from what I just said before about counting, counting is not the only point here. The point is understanding where do we want to be? What do we want to be? Who do we want to be? What kind of society do we want to have? And as Curitiba did, how do you invent into that? The proper question here is not can we do this or can we afford to do this? It's what do we want to do and how do we do it? How do we create the conditions and create the opportunities out of thin air if need be? Uh, there's a professor on campus, a guy named Gray Brecken in the geography department. I don't know if any of you know him. Gray's been chronicling uh, uh, as, as, photo, as photojournalism the works of the, of the Works Progress Administration in the New Deal. If you walk, it's his slideshow is magnificent, it's, it's deeply inspiring, and it's, it's akin to walking through any city in the United States and seeing the thousands of roads and bridges and parks and schools and clinics and, you know, the urban infrastructure of this country was created as a public act of will in the early 1930s at a time of no money, in the deepest depression we had ever known, by an act of social will to say, we need to bring people together to create real wealth, not derivatives and instruments that nobody understands, but real wealth that provides a support system for the emergence of other kinds of real wealth. And it wasn't because, it, we didn't do it out of having money. Now, we're in a different situation now. We are, you know, we're looking at a loss of something like 10% of GDP in this meltdown. We're looking at a massive level of debt that we didn't go into the Great Depression with. But still, you know, we're talking about money, and money is an abstraction. Sorry if that you know, is offensive to any business students or economists here, but money is an abstraction. It's a way that we measure real things. There's a wonderful essay by Alan Watts, um, um, who some of you, you know, with gray hairs may remember as a great, uh, uh, a great teacher in the 60s and 70s. And uh, Watts wrote an essay about, about a, a, a workman coming to work on the first day of the Great Depression in the 1930s. And he comes to his job site, and the boss says, you got to go home, Larry. There's just no work today. And Larry says, wait a minute, these people want this building, and there's, you know, and here's a workforce here, and there's wood, and there's rock, and there's concrete, and there's trucks, and there's tools. Let's go to work. And the boss says, no, no, you don't understand. We can't go to work. There's no inches. We ran out of inches. And Larry says, well, what about, who cares about the inches? We've got the tools, we've got the materials, we've got the people. Can't we do it anyway? We need to not get stuck in thinking that we don't have the inches when the opportunity now is to create the infrastructure for the new economy. That's the job right now. Thank what you. What do you do? <laughs> uh, my name is Neil Sinclair, and I'm the uh, chairman and CEO of a company called Cybertran International. Uh, this was a project that came out of the United States Department of Energy in uh, the early 90s, actually, in invented by a, a brilliant engineer there, John Darian. John had a PhD in civil engineering and a minor in computers. John was the guy they put in charge of the cleanup at Three Mile Island. A uh, brilliant man. And uh, he developed as a response to recognizing the very high cost of building passenger rail systems, and particularly high-speed rail, he developed an innovative method which he called Cybertran, which is short for cybernetic transportation. And uh, the story is that Amory Lovins came to his lab one day and saw the vehicle that John had developed and pointed his finger at it and said, that's it. Uh, and it, this is mentioned in, in the book Natural Capitalism as an example of doing more with less. Uh, the approach was, how do we overcome this issue of the very, very high cost of building conventional rail the conventional way? The BART to, uh, from Fremont to San Jose line, you may be familiar with, uh, there's a uh, tax measure on the Santa Clara County ballot this, uh, this year to try to pay for the operating losses for the system. That is a 16-mile long corridor. It's estimated to cost about $6 billion to build it. Now, it's about $400 million a mile. So why does this stuff cost so much? So what John did 
was he started with a blank sheet of paper systems engineering process and figured out that the real issue was if you had big trains, they had to run on big infrastructure, very expensive big infrastructure. Well, why don't you make the vehicles smaller? Well, you can make them smaller and that'll, that'll lighten up the load on the infrastructure and make the infrastructure cost less, but you can't make them too small or you basically run in a fleet of taxi cabs. So they concluded that a vehicle of about 10,000 pounds, about 20 passengers more or less, was the sweet spot for minimum system cost. So he looked at other innovation that had been done in other areas and concluded that a system that uh, had offline stations was driverless using the kind of automation they had developed at the Idaho National Engineering Lab for as a matter of fact, nuclear power plants, uh, was applicable in that the data processing needs of systems to control this were far less than Strategic Air Command was using to run the uh, Air Force's planes around the world. So it was entirely feasible. It required no new science. Uh, the only uh, American light rail vehicle provider in the United States at that time, Morris Knudsen, which you business students, if you haven't studied the, uh, the AG story of MK, you should. It's a class example of how to bring down a company. Um, Morrison Knudsen, at this time based in Boise, studied the system and they said, this is gonna cost from 10 to 50% of the cost of conventional technology. So John went to the DOE and he said, where's the check? How do we do the research and development? And uh, MK said, you guys go develop it because it's government's job. And the, and the DOE said, we don't have a transit mission. And so this thing basically limped along with internal research and development money until in 1998. Uh, I was working with John and we got about a quarter million dollars from DOT. We took all of the technology out of the national lab. We vested in this company called Cybertrain International. And uh, I have a couple of guys here with me today that uh, uh, one is our head, re head engineer, uh, used to be head of research for BART. Our Chief Operating Officer, worked for uh, Booz Allen for 13 years in British Rail, and we are in the process of implementing this in the private sector. The, the advantages of it, when we've done the analysis, compared to automobiles, the material efficiency improvement is about a factor of 42 to one in terms of waste that would result from the use of just basically tons of vehicle. The energy efficiency improvements is about 90%. So we're, we're, we're able to actually get a return on the cost so that we can amortize the capital costs of this system because of the differential between uh, revenues that we can pull in off of the operations against our o &M, our operation maintenance costs. Well, long and short of it is it can be profitable and it can pay for itself. We're working with two government agencies in the Bay Area now working on implementation. It's an absolute uphill slog. It is. In, any of you that uh, have a rich uncle that wants to build a train, talk to me later. Uh, but we are in the process of implementing this. Is that, that's the short yeah. answer. Yeah, so how many of you would like to have uh, individualized mass transit? Here we go, standing right here. We can do it, we have the technology. And what we have now is the opportunity to really rethink every single system and say, what can we invest in now that will deliver genuine human well-being and economic growth and jobs and et cetera. Dan Kamen right here at Berkeley has shown if you invest in renewables, you'll get 10 times the jobs of investing in coal. Efficiency is even better than that. So I'm really optimistic, <laughs> but uh, we don't have a lot of time. Thanks. I think what I'd like to do is, is give the audience a chance to, to ask some questions as well. I mean, this has been a very uh, special experience for me. When I was about 14 years old, I was a big fan of, of, of magicians uh, and, and went you know, at a very impressionable age to this one magician and he had this beautiful, well put together assistant and he put her in this box and, and lo and behold, there were two of them. And then a little bit later he did something else and lo and behold, there were three of them. Well, of course they were triplets. But uh, I think it's really remarkable that we've been able to turn one speaker into three. So I think I want to thank. Uh... Okay. 
So, so what I'd like to do is a little bit differently, maybe take a, a series of maybe four questions simultaneously and then ask that they be answered uh, kind of as a group. So if they can be somewhat grouped, that would even be better, but uh, let's see how it goes. So who would like to ask a question? Uh, you can also make comments uh, as long as they are no more than one minute. Uh, we've been discussing mostly about the developed world. I would like to know, uh, to have you guys make comments on what we can do to involve the global south and China in uh, projects like uh, carbon trading? Okay. Another question? If related to that would be best, but... Uh... This is not exactly related. But um, you mentioned that, you know, I think Hunter and Gill both talk about how it just makes sense to invest in all these energy efficiency programs, carbon trading programs, because there's phenomenal ROI. However, there's a whole host of environmental and social initiatives that don't return that well. And companies like Patagonia, for example, have specifically chosen to stay private so that they can make certain financial trade-offs in order to pursue environmental and social initiatives. So. How do you propose that businesses and organizations approach social and environmental change when the ROI isn't so spectacular? Okay, one more. So every day at Berkeley or reading the newspaper, we hear about a host of problems, whether they be poverty or environmental challenges, healthcare crisis. And I'm always trying to think, you know, which comes first? Like, you can't address environmental problems if you're not healthy, but you can't live, and therefore address environmental problems. You know, it's just circular reasoning. So how do we give people a sense of the priorities in terms of the world's problems and where to focus their energy, and potentially how to, in our own minds, categorize that as to which problems are most pressing? Okay, I think that's a nice group of questions. We've talked about priorities globally. How do we, you know, are there some things that have to come before others uh, in general, particularly in the environmental field? Are there some that are more attractive or more likely to attract funding, uh, but while others perhaps equally important uh, are left behind? And then uh, what about the rest of the world? How do we bring the South into this dialogue, particularly China, uh, which I think all will, would agree is the, uh, the, the 800-pound gorilla in, in this particular room. Well, the, ga the game is won or lost in China. But let me start with the last question about how do you deal with all these interweaving priorities. And I think the key is that they're interweaving. They're not separate. Uh, and so rather than try to deal with them one at a time, carved up into little pieces trying to optimize the the benefit or the ROI of each one, if we can understand the interconnection, then we can see the opportunities like in Curitiba and the opportunities like with Cybertran uh, and look at how do you solve these problems together. Key to that is understanding what, what is it that you, again, what is it that you really want? What does the solution look like? Which is to say, what do we really care about? And this is a very non-quantitative uh, question. This is a question of human spirit and human passion and requires conversations among people in companies and in communities and in families talking about what is it that we really want? What is it that really motivates us? What really are our aspirations? Uh, you know, what really is prosperity? Prosperity is not about money. Prosperity is about moving toward the dream. Pro spera, toward hope, right? So part of it is to talk about that. And part of it, in the wonderful presentation of the gentleman from Cybertran, he said some remarkable things there. You know, one, of it, you know, one thing that he said was remarkable was things like 90% reduction in energy cost and 42%, 42 times more effective than thus and such. These are not little incremental improvements, folks. This is, this is massive innovation. And I don't know if you heard the phrase he said early on in his presentation. He said these two magic words called systems engineering. I don't know if any of you have ever heard those words spoken or spoken very often on campus. Listen for them. See where you hear them, see where you don't hear them, talk with your engineering professors. Look for where there are opportunities for cross-disciplinary design and innovation here to, to take on multiple problems at once. Do you do jobs or do you do energy or do you do health? They're, they're the same problem. So if you do them together, you find a different kind of solution than if you try to do them in sequence. And I think the same is true if you're looking at is it China or is it the US? Yes. 
If we don't, the Chinese say they won't. In fact, they are moving in many ways faster than we are, and the Indians are moving even faster than that. Much of the renewable innovation is now going on in China and India. The world's first green billionaire exists. Sorry, Bill McDonough. He's a Chinese solar entrepreneur. And the Chinese realize they cannot develop. Their, their goal is half their population middle class by 2020. Lester Brown has pointed out, if China continues to grow at the rate that it has and uses resources as efficiently as we do, they're now fourfold less. By 2030, they will want more oil than the world now lifts or probably can ever lift, and more cars and coal and concrete and cotton and everything. In fact, there's a new book out called Peak Everything. And when I give talks, uh, you know, Royal Dutch Shell, when it uh, tries to do what it calls scenario planning, which is to understand what the future might look like, not to predict it, but to understand a variety of plausible stories about how the future could unfold, looks for what it calls drivers of change, because these are signs that business as usual will not long endure. Uh, if any of you have been watching, the last week, I think, is one of those drivers of change. This fact that Chindia, China and India, are in the world market for everything is one of those drivers of change. The fact that we're losing every ecosystem on the planet, carbon-constrained world, peak oil, vulnerability of systems. And you start adding up, again, as Dana Meadows said, add up all these challenges that are facing us. We are going to change. That's a given. What is our choice is what direction we want that change to go in. And that's very much our choice. We will either continue, as we have as an American society, to abdicate leadership in the world and to say, party on, in which case I would su submit the future will be rather grim. And the United States will come to be, in effect, Uganda with bombs. We are already a debtor nation, rather seriously. And we have a declining standard of living. We are no longer the world's highest standard of living. And all indices, you know, Gil said, what do we want? All indices of what it is that people want are declining in the United States, including happiness. We're nowhere near the happiest nation on Earth. And people are starting to measure what is happiness and which country is the happiest. We're not. So what is it that we want? And then let's start doing whole systems thinking about how do we meet all of these priorities in ways that unleash the, what America has always been so great at, which is this spirit of innovation. In, uh, famous last words of a dead redneck, hey, Bubba, watch this. <laughs> but that's what Americans are great at. I can do that. Well, hell, give it a go. And so let's, let's take technologies like Cybertran. We know that we have, and give it a go. Instead of uh, inventing uh, crazy things like derivatives. <clears throat> okay, let's have another round of questions. While, while she's passing around, let me just ask one follow-up question on, as the uh, take the <laughs> moderator's uh, privilege here. Um, you know, you talk about these these challenges and choices as as business choices and engineering options. What about the political dimension? <laughs> um, aren't they really fundamentally political choices in which perhaps there are di divergent interests will answer, I mean, there are diver divergent we's in that vision for the future? We've allowed it to become that. We've allowed a very well-organized campaign by, a, by people who have a particular vested interest to drive our definition of what politics is to the point where it's gotten pretty nasty. You know, Congress used to be a bicameral and frequently bipartisan group of representatives of the country that wrestled over issues but wrestled in a, in a civil sort of fashion. It's not that anymore. We've allowed this small group of people to drive politics to extremes, and to nastiness, and to non-solutions. And frankly, I think it's time that those of us who would like to see some solutions start standing up and, and holding politicians accountable for 
okay, what's your solution here? More people voted in the last general election for American Idol than voted for president. So I say democracy is a contact sport. Are you in it? And, and I said your homework's go read Dana Meadows. Your real homework is take somebody to the polls. I'm sure everyone in this room is going to vote. Take somebody with you who you otherwise would be inclined to not to vote. F go, that's your homework. Go find somebody who says, nah, I'm not going to vote, and take them with you. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm wondering if you can explain or get into some of the complexities in assigning value to natural capital. So you talked about carbon being one of the largest growing commodity markets. Um, but within that, you know, carbon is traded in the EU, that there's a market price for it. It inherently is excluding um, co-benefits, so like the values of other ecosystem services that might be tied into uh, reforestation or local people's livelihoods. And I'm think, wondering, you know, as we start assigning more and more value to different kinds of natural capital, be it biodiversity or water or carbon, what are we leaving out and how do we negotiate that value? <laughs> Do you want to take that one? Uh, You're the metrics we've got, guy. We've got a couple questions. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, a couple questions. I was just going to ask a question. Um, one of the principles of natural capitalism that you talk about is this service and flow economy, if, I, if, if that's the right name, where um, rather than purchasing goods, um, we're actually going to be purchasing services. Um, and, and to me, this was an interesting but seemingly pretty radical shift. And I'm curious if you can talk about how, I mean, if you, how you see this actually that shift actually occurring. And maybe for those who haven't read, read your book, maybe you could uh, just describe briefly this idea of the service and flow economy. One more. Over here. Um, I wanted to follow up a little bit on the cyber trend. Um, there's a whole network of people discussing advanced transportation that's very efficient, and essentially about 20 people, which is called large group rapid transit, is essentially where things are at. But as time goes on, things are going to get smaller and smaller. And the big new infrastructures are going to have to go into places like China and India, which you mentioned. This is essentially called the Asia strategy. And China already is the leader in terms of what's in their prototypes and laboratories and facilities. They're buying technological uh, property from, um, from Europe and the United States and making sure that the future transportation system, they're going to be part of it. Um, and it, essentially, it's going to be international. In other words, the Koreans are together with the Swedes, and, and Abu Dhabi is taking with, with Europe. And uh, how do you see, the uh, on this very big issue of transportation, um, the best ways of facilitating this international cooperation? Because pretty much efforts have, have been national at this point, they're really moving international and things are beginning to move a little bit. All right, so two questions there, uh, really getting to the core of, uh, of natural capital, uh, capitalism. Uh, what are uh, that whole question of value around, uh, around resources and, and uh, the complexities of that and, and perhaps trade-offs between them? Uh, and then the very, very core uh, thesis that you put out on, um, on, on services, natural services. And then uh, a little follow-up on, uh, on transportation. Gil, do you want to talk, uh, first of all, about how you value things? Uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. <laughs> um, uh, uh, the, the short answer is that we don't know. Yeah. We don't know how to do this, we need, but we need to learn how to do this. And what we do know now is that we need to learn how to do this. So there's a great deal of discovery and, and invention. Uh, one resource to go to, if you haven't seen it, is ecosystemmarketplace.com, which is sort of a compendium resource of a lot of the efforts around this work. Uh, right now, I think we have two ways to do this. Uh, one is that we look to the markets to set a price. That's what carbon trading, cap and trade is getting to. There's different prices in the United States and Europe for a ton of carbon because there's different constraints on that market. Uh, but this all is sort of a, you know, a, a decentralized way to let players in the market find what, negotiate what they think is appropriate value. That's one way. Uh, the other way is to look at the, um, um, I don't know what the economic term for this would be, but to look at the comparative costs and benefits. What are, what are the value of the services based on what it would take to replace them? What's the utility that's provided by water cleansing services in an ecosystem, uh, by air cleansing services in a forest and so forth? And, and how do you then 
replace those or use those to replace other more expensive technological strategies that we might do otherwise. Uh, just for a sense of scale, check out a book called Nature's Services by, uh, edited by Gretchen Daly from Stanford. It's been one of the real pioneers in this field and watch, watch her space this fall. There's some major new stuff coming out from her shop this fall. Uh, in Nature Services, she gathered together a bunch of scientists and economists to try to assign a value to the services that nature provides to the human economy worldwide. The number they came up with, this was a 1999 estimate, uh, was $33 trillion, which is a very large number and one that has no meaning until you look at it in relation to something else. The something else that's most useful to look at is the human economy, which at that time, the global GDP was $18 trillion. So in other words, Daly's findings were that the free services provided by nature in support of the hu human economy and human society were almost double the value of everything that we count, measure, and value. Uh, so that's an interesting resource to look at. There's the International Society of Ecological Economics. Some, uh, some of the leaders of that are here on campus, and they're the ones who are doing the heavy lifting of building the analytical methodologies to get at that. But I think you start with those two polls, and the third, um, uh, which I heard from E.F. Schumacher decades ago, the guy who wrote Small is Beautiful, a wonderful book worth digging out and, and treasuring. Um, Fritz Schumacher talked about a, a, a citizen intervention in Great Britain. The government was going to build a motorway through the countryside. The motorway was going to run through an old church. They were doing an eminent domain proceedings to move the church or take it down. Government pr had proposed a value for it that they would pay the community to replace it of some tens of millions of pounds. And the community came to the government and said, no, actually, this is 500 million pounds. Why, the government said, because we say so, said the community, because we, ca because we care about it and that's what it's worth to us. So that's really the third way that you get to value. And then among those three, we build tools and we negotiate. And again, I've said this a few times, I'll say it again, we talk to each other. We talk to each other about what we really care about. That's what politics actually is. It's the gathering of people in community to share their concerns and figure out how to achieve them. Um, and if we can get out of this, this rough and tumble time of weird politics that we're in, uh, hopeful sign there. Uh, you know, look at how the polls responded to the McCain-Palin campaign going sharply negative in the last few weeks. Yeah. Polls dove, McCain backed off. So there's a lesson there, and it's not just us that's tired of this. There's a lot of people that are tired of this. And so I would say don't just take somebody to the polls who might not vote. Have a conversation with somebody who you might not talk to about this stuff and who you might not agree with. And you might think that you couldn't even stand talking with. And have a conversation that is engaged and collegial and positive and see what you can agree on. Because I guarantee you there are things. Search for Common Ground. John Marks at Search for Common Ground in Washington has made it a, 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 a mission over the last 30 years to bring together irreconcilable conflicts. Abortion rights versus right to life. Uh, both sides in Ireland, both sides in Palestine, Israel, to get people who are either figuratively or literally ready to kill each other over an idea. To bring them together and talk about what are the things that they agree on. Not to paper over the differences, but to find what they agree on and use that as the basis for a conversation and collaboration to work on that, and then from that find ways that they can build a bridge on the things that they disagree with. Imagine your life without oil. Very, very plausible. The uh, International Energy Agency said uh, about a year ago, expect serious constraints on the supply of oil within a year and a half. The Germans think it's two years. Matt Simmons, who wrote the book Twilight in the Desert, thinks the world peaked in terms of its capacity to extract oil at an exponentially growing rate about two years ago, three years ago. Sim Simmons is not just a guy, he's the head of a major Houston energy investment bank, so he yeah. pays attention to this stuff. <laughs> imagine your life without oil, and then imagine who it is you would turn to for help. And begin to think about who lives around you, and where you would get your food, and your water, and your energy, I think we need to start relocalizing, and as Gil said, have these conversations. And a good place to start is what do you care about? Particularly with people with whom you disagree. We've, in a sense, cheap energy has allowed us to become 
little autarkic figures in our uh, individual automobiles, as Andres Duani said, uh, aggressive competition over square meters of asphalt from behind windshields. That's a shitty way to live. Let's get out of our cars and start having neighbors. Now, on, um, you know, how do you count the value of things? Gil's right, we don't know. No clue. But we better start finding out. The utility red regulator, Peter Bradford, said it's better to be approximately right than precisely wrong. And counting these services that nature gives us, whether it be a, a low level of carbon in the atmosphere or the ability to detoxify the wastes that we strew around or a stable climate, the insurance companies care about this one a lot, or pollination, where are all the bees going? And you start counting up these free services, some of them arguably have a value that's infinite. We can't have life without them. So we probably better start assigning at least shadow prices. And this is a discipline that's called full cost accounting, or <laughs> partial cost accounting, at least saying that here's a list of things that at the moment we're not counting, they have value. Let's at least say in the economic equation that they have value. Now, interestingly, uh, about two years ago, FASB announced that, uh, what is this, Federation of uh, uh, Financial, Accounting Financial Accounting Standards, Standards Board, Board, said we're going to redefine what profit means. Because the way we define profit now is driving people to short-term day trader mentality, which is actually ruining the value of companies. <laughs> Go figure. Imagine that. Here we are with you know, companies lying in ruins because of this day trader mentality. Uh, my, my CEO at Natural Capitalism, I mean, none of us have a hell of a lot of money, but we have little retirement funds. He said to me today he's not sleeping at night with the volatility of the market. I mean, one day he has a retirement fund, and the next day he has essentially nothing. This is a lousy way to live. So let's start assigning value to these. Now, this is what the economists love. They say carbon should have a price, so let's put a price on it. 50 bucks a ton. Is that the right number? And the economists say, but it's, it's predictable. So if we can get it through the politicians, Let's just put a tax on carbon, and then everybody will behave wisely. Will they? No. We'll just have uh, higher prices for various things. And I think what we really need to do, particularly in this discussion of the future of capitalism, is to recognize the strength of market mechanisms. Prices matter. But how do you know the right price? And what does price drive you to do? Apparently, when gasoline hits four bucks a gallon, it makes a difference. Empirically, look at the last six months. It hit four bucks a gallon. My cowboy friends all started getting rid of their pickup trucks. I was like amazed. They were very happy at 375, and now that it's gone back down, they're all buying their pickup trucks again, in part because Detroit's giving them away. But there are levels at which you actually hit price elasticity. What are they? Hell, I don't know. And the guys at Chicago Climate Exchange are saying, don't set a government price on carbon. Let's let the market do that. Let's create a trading regime and put a fixed cap. You can only emit so much carbon that will decline over time, which is what the scientists say has to happen, and then let the market figure out what the right price is. Now, is carbon the only thing we should be pricing? No, of course not. But the more of these services that we actually start bringing into some framework of market mechanisms bounded by a level playing field, or a set of rules on which the market can sort it out. You know, this I said before, we've been subjected to 30 years of a it wasn't really a conspiracy. It was just a very well-organized campaign to delegitimize the role of government. All business wants is government off its back. No, business can't do business without a level playing field. You want to do business without a government? Go to Somalia. Functional chaocracy? Go for it. Or parts of Afghanistan. 
You need to know that you have title to land, that you have a legal system in which you can resolve disputes, a fair tax system in which people perceive that what they're paying is fair. And we're, we, we've been eroding all of this social cohesion. I think it's time to start putting it back. Now, on um, this notion of a solutions economy, this was something that Amory's particularly fond of. It was first put forth by some guy na guys named Womack and Jones in a book called Lean Thinking, that um, rather than making and selling things, what is it you want? You want the service of the thing. So deliver that. Uh, it makes very good sense in the case of electricity. None of us want a kilowatt hour of electricity. What we want is the ability to see, the ability to run a microphone, the ability to get from here to there, or better, have access to what it is we want, comfort in a building. So why don't we pay for those things, not the kilowatt hour that we have become accustomed to having delivered to us as the means to get them. So Interface said, well, we're going to, rather than selling Broadloom carpet like this, we will sell the service of floor covering. They couldn't make it work. And where I come down on this, what used to be, you read uh, chapter one of Natural Capitalism, there will be a list of four principles. I actually think there are three principles of natural capitalism. I've dropped the solutions economy, used to be the third one. Fingers don't work that way. I've dropped the third one down to a tool. I was in uh, Vienna speaking to Unido, and uh, a guy from uh, one of the European agencies said, would one of you big thinkers please spell out for the rest of us in this whole sustainability thing, what are frameworks and what are tools? Huh, I'd never thought of it that way. So I sat down and tried to list out what are the frameworks of sustainability. And I think they are natural step, which has four principles, the four system conditions of the natural step. Substances taken from the Earth's crust cannot systematically increase in nature. Substances made by people, plastic and such, cannot systematically increase in nature. The biological basis of productivity cannot be systematically diminished. And we have to be fair and efficient in distributing goods. That's the nod to people. Fair, fair and efficient in meeting basic, basic human, human needs. Basic human needs. Because you can't have a stable, sustainable society if basic human needs aren't met worldwide. And that, I think, is a good framework of sustainability. The trouble is it turned out to be very difficult to implement it Monday morning. We came up with natural capitalism, which originally had four principles. Originally, the principles were radical increases in resource productivity. Oh, God, I'm going to forget the second principle. Um, thank you. It is in chapter one. God, it's getting late. Um, the third one was this notion of the solution. Oh, biomimicry. Biomimicry was to um, do business the way nature does. The solutions economy, sell the service desired rather than the thing itself, and then um, be restorative of human and natural capital. I think the principles of natural capitalism now are slightly different. Buy time by using resources dramatically more productively. I think what matters is that we push off these drivers of change and buy time to implement more fundamental principles of sustainability like redesign how we make and deliver everything using principles like biomimicry and cradle to cradle, both uh, Bill McDonough's cradle to cradle and Walter Stahel's. Uh, Bill stole the phrase, Walter used it 25 years ago in Europe, to mean something quite different. And then manage all institutions to be restorative of the capital that's in short supply human and natural. I think ecological economics is coming to be a framework of sustainability. And Alan Savory's holistic management, I think, is a framework of sustainability. Now, McDonough would argue with me. He would say cradle to cradle is a framework. Fine, let it be a framework. I think it's a tool, but fine, let it be a framework. So what's the difference between a framework and a tool and a principle? 
I think a What's framework, the definitional difference? I think a framework tells you what sustainability is when you achieve it and gives you a roadmap of how to get there. The roadmap, the principles, are the tools. And then there are higher level and lower level tools. So resource yeah, efficiency. See, to my, see, to my mind, the, the, the principles, natural, the natural capital list would be a set of principles. So the framework is where do you want to go and how do you know if you, natural step calls itself a compass. How do you know if you're moving in the right direction? What's the test of direction? And that's what those four system conditions mm -hmm. give you. The natural capital principles give you a first, uh, a high level frame set of principles of how do you do that? What do you do to get to that? Well, here are some basic guiding principles. Then within that, then you get specific techniques and tools and that hierarchy of framework or mindset and principles and tools and techniques is a, which Bill Reed talks about as a, as a, as a, as a hierarchy of, 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 of resources, is very powerful. We tend as a society to start with techniques yeah. and tools. We start from the bottom of this hierarchy to fiddle with little, you know, adjust the lug wrenches over here. And it's much more powerful to think first at the level of framework, how does the system work? What do you care about? What would success look like? How would you know what kind of principles could get you there? And then what toolboxes do you build to support and implement those principles? So for example, design for environment would be a tool. Uh, industrial ecology, uh, there, are whole, there are hundreds now of tools within the toolbox of sustainability. And it would be nice, actually, if uh, some of us would get together and write that up, eh? <laughs> we could do that. <laughs> All right, well, listen, I'd like to, to suggest we take your suggestion and promote conversation uh, by adjourning to the, the back of the room. We have some refreshments and really hope we can have them some vibrant dialogue uh, amongst us. But I want you all to, to join me in thanking Hunter and Gil. Uh, Uh, thanks to uh, to George for moderating a very uh, rambunctious panel. So thank you so much. Thank you.